CNN, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you about an article that appeared on the subject of Congress's uh, reaction when the President said he would make a strike on Syria. Now, what I don't like that you sent, dear CNN, is that we're now going to have this page of print saying, here's how things could play out. It's not a matter of how things would play out in Congress. The important thing is, we have a, hmm, and a very naughty presidential statement, as we have had from most of our recent presidents, that they are willing to start a war without Congress's permission. Well, it's not even a question of permission. Only Congress can declare war. And why is that? Well, the framers of the Constitution in 1787 had it all figured out that a president, for one thing, is under um, sort of personal pressure, perhaps from other diplomatic channels to do certain things about war. He's certainly under pressure from defense contractors to uh, keep the wars going. And it should only ever be in the hands of the people. And your representatives in Congress are supposedly the people. So my complaint is, first of all, that instead of talking about that issue, CNN is telling us how things would play out. Well, it makes for a you know, nice page of ink. And it said the first thing that Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid is expected to take the first procedural step to overcome an anticipated filibuster. That's because Rand Paul, God love him, did a filibuster, as you may know, took 13 hours. He's not allowed to leave the room, so we had to not drink too much water, if you know what I mean. And during that whole time, he was preventing a vote coming before the Senate on the subject of confirming the appointment of a CIA nominee because that person had not uh, distanced himself from or otherwise condemned the policy of killing Americans with drones. So, Rand Paul was the senator from Kentucky and, as everyone says, the son of a previous congressman named Ron Paul, who ran for president, until CNN and other networks didn't let him be seen on the debates. That's beside the point. The son knows what he's doing. Finally, somebody in Congress, 535 members of Congress, and one of them knows what's in the Constitution and says we simply can't for one minute tolerate, for 13 hours he said, we cannot for one minute tolerate having, allowing the president to declare the right to kill Americans without bringing them to trial, without charging them with a crime. Amazing. Isn't it amazing? Anyway, this fine man got up and did it. So now that you're making the story here that this new thing about Syria, well, we're going to think about filibusters. Yeah, well, we do, but that's not the important thing. Now, in your next statement here, you say that um, the members, all House members, will get an intelligence briefing from Senate Secretary of State Kerry. Please, a briefing. Please. Briefing on what will, what is happening in Syria, please. That's not the person who could do that briefing. Right. Then it says um, Obama will take his uh, case about the strike to the American people by having a TV show, and that's correct. It, it's perfectly all right. It'd be like the king in England or the queen in Australia, where I live. She is a an extra person, an extra power to whom the people can turn. And I believe in the Middle Ages, the king was seen to be, in England was seen to be, the people's person would go to him. So that is correct if our president would go to the people. But we then go on to say, and just sort of quoting as if it was an interesting or important quote, the president hasn't said whether, or whether he would go forward with a strike should Congress vote against his proposal? Hello, hello. The president hasn't said whether he would go ahead with it. Yeah. Of course, we realize 
he can't do that. And the colonists could immediately slap him down by impeaching him, and it would take only a day to do that. And that would be the end of that idea of him going to war without Congress's permission. The Congressional gift of power on this subject is Article 1, Section 8, uh, Clause 11, I believe, which says Congress has the power to declare war. You may say that in the Constitution it also says the President is Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. Sure, but only when a war is happening under Congress's wishes for it to happen. And the reason why the President is in that seemingly military position is to prevent us from having the military itself rise up and make decisions. It always has to be a civilian who has the authority to do that. Then you go on to quote this guy named McDonough. The president ultimately is going to make this decision, like whether he'll override Congress, in co oh, the decision about Syria, in a consultation with Congress on our timeline, he said, as of Sunday morning, and what he said is that we will make it in terms of our interests. What's the hour there? First of all, the chief of staff of the White House, whom you're quoting as if it is a position, it's not a position, it's like the scullery maid. I mean, it doesn't exist. He works in the White House, big deal. There is no such authority as the White House chief of staff, right? It's, it's the president's errand boy. Anyway, when this guy gets up and he says that the decision will be made in our interests, I'm pretty sure he means of the executive branch of government rather than the congressional, which of course is just plain treason, you can't do that, but our interests, our, does he think he has an interest? I mean, that in itself is a terrible problem if we are saying that on a decision to go to war that a president has an interest, but then my that Now, the next guy I'm proud of from Massachusetts, sometimes known as Massachusetts, Representative McGovern was one of the 123 members of the House who have said they plan to vote no. So that's 123 out of 435, not too great, but it's something. And this guy says, he argued, I'm a big supporter of President Obama. I support him on almost everything. But sometimes friends can disagree. This is not a question about party loyalty. He says it's a vote of conscience. I'm sorry, but every vote is a vote of conscience. There's no distinction between when you follow the party. We don't have the Westminster system here as we do in England and Australia. And that is, and it's disgraceful, they shouldn't have it. It's absolutely shockingly, it's embarrassing. You're supposed to vote at your party's call. represents his district and in some sense represents the whole nation, the people, and they don't represent a party. The party's got their little way coming in pretty soon after the formation of our country. I think by 1789 the first Congress was sitting and like a minute later there were parties and then some of the states legislated. There's never been federal legislation to honor the parties in any way, but a state might say Oh, we uh, permit the leaders of the two, blah, blah, and even in the Congress itself, not through legislation, but just through House rules and Senate rules. They're both houses, really. House of the Senate. They don't call it that, do they? House of Representatives. They each can make their own rules just by voting amongst themselves. I think just by a simple majority, I'm not sure. But even if it was different than that, even they demanded 90%. That, too, is their rule that they have invented. And they have said things like, we will have a leader of each party. So each year you have somebody known as the Speaker of the House, who is the leader of the party that has the most seats. Now I'm going off the track to say parties, they don't exist as far as a decision of any, any member of Congress to vote on whether there should be a war or not. 